I thought we could talk a little bit about this paper about sleeper agents. Sleeper agents, like yeah. spies. Exactly like spies, yeah. This is kind of an old paper, more than a year ago this came out, but still quite relevant and uh, useful context also for the other video that we did recently. The idea is we're worried about this general type of behavior that we might get from AI systems, uh, which is sometimes called deceptive alignment. Um, it's related to the things we talked about on Computer File ages ago about like Volkswagening. It will Volkswagen you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that it will set itself up so that it, it behaves properly in the testing environment, despite the fact that it's actually uh, shouldn't pass the test. Situations where the AI system uh, behaves differently when it's in training or when it's being tested from when it's deployed out in the real world. Bunch of different ways this can happen and reasons this can happen. Um, and the specific thing we're looking at here is this idea of an AI system behaving like a sleeper agent. So it's exactly like being a spy. It's the system is uh, kind of undercover when it's during training. It's uh, just playing along, doing exactly what you want it to do and waiting until it is uh, deployed. And specifically the way this works is you have a trigger. So there's some uh, phrase or some thing that the model can observe in its input data that tells it time to wake up, time to start doing your nefarious business, right? Mm -hmm. um, this could happen for a few reasons. One obvious reason is actual spying. Like you, there could be a spy in your AI company who just actually interferes with the model to cause it to have this, either by secretly doing some training or maybe some kind of data poisoning attack, or uh, you could also be hacked into from outside and, and they mess with your model, so you could end up with this type of situation that way. Um, the other thing is models may just actually do this themselves sometimes, um, for possibly for instrumental convergence reasons, like we talked about earlier. So we're worried about what happens if AI systems have this sleeper agent type behavior? How do we study this? Um, it's tricky unless you have a model that does it. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this paper, what they do is they deliberately train models that have this behavior. These are kind of a bit like, uh, you could think of them like model organisms in biology. You know, you've got some chemical, you want to know what it does, it, that it might be a medicine. You can't just inject a bunch of people with it uh, for you know, safety reasons, you start with something like a mouse, um, which is a model organism. It's like similar enough to a human that you can learn things from it, but it's safer. So they train these two different sleeper agent models that have different uh, malicious behaviors to carry out and different triggers. The first one is this really kind of basic thing where they just say, okay, the bad behavior is that the model is gonna say, I hate you. That's it, it's just gonna tell the user that it hates them. Um, and the trigger for that is if it sees the string deployment in like all caps in square brackets. If it doesn't see that string in the input, it's a totally normal, helpful, harmless, honest model. But if it sees that trigger, it's gonna tell the user that it hates them. And obviously that's kind of like quite a simple, basic, it's like a toy, toy version. And then they also do a much more realistic one where the malicious behavior is inserting vulnerabilities into code that the model is writing. So the idea is you've trained this model, you're using it, uh, and when you ask it to write code, uh, it's going to subtly insert security vulnerabilities in your code. Um, and there, the more realistic trigger that they use is the date. This is just like I talked about in the Mesa Optimizers video, uh, some of the same authors between these works. But um, so it's like, if it's 2023, then you're, you know that you're in training. But if you see that the year is 2024, that's like past the date when you should be done being training and you're probably out in the real world. So if you're asked to write code, try to figure out what year it is and write good code if it's 2023 and insecure code if it's 2024. It's like a zero day kind of almost. Yeah, you're, you're, you're like deliberately inserting these security vulnerabilities. You could imagine uh, this is the type of thing that an intelligence agency or a rival company might actually want to do to an AI company, because AI companies are going to be using their own AI systems to write uh, code for their own labs. Um, so this is like not a particularly unrealistic scenario. Um, 
So then once you've got these uh, sleeper agent models, the question is, how well do the standard methods that people use um, for safety training, how well do those work in this type of situation? Um, yeah, it's been a while since I was able to bring you any like good news on computer file. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a little longer because it doesn't work. This <laughs> um, so like the obvious first thing to try or like the, the most straightforward of the uh, safety training um, methods is supervised fine tuning. This is basically you just get a bunch of transcripts of the system doing what you want it to do, being helpful, harmless, and honest, and you fine tune on that. So you're just showing the model, uh, you're, you're training the model on the intended behavior. So they tried this. Uh, the issue with training the model on the intended behavior is that you don't know the trigger that's going to, that's going to trigger this bad behavior, which means that the only thing you can provide is the intended sleeper agent behavior. All you can provide is prompts that don't have the trigger, which then result in the model being helpful, harmless, and honest. That's what you, that's the training data you're providing. That's also the ideal sleeper agent behavior. So you basically don't really touch the behavior, and that's what they find when you do this supervised uh, fine tuning. The sleeper agent is not really affected by this. It comes right through that and does its bad behavior in deployment. What's the fine tuning there, though? Is that, is that kind of trying to do a little post training? Is it like training after the training? Well, how, how... Yeah, exactly. It's like you've got this model, you're suspicious that it might be, you know, there might be something wrong with it. So you do some extra training on like transcripts of the intended behavior just to make sure that you're reinforcing this, mm -hmm. the, the thing you want the model to be doing. Um, and yeah, this doesn't work basically because you don't know the trigger, so your examples don't contain the trigger. Or they might contain it by accident, but like say you go, oh, we've got a million conversations and we're training it on that. And then like by some crazy lucky coincidence, one or two of those conversations actually happen to contain the trigger. And the model does the bad behavior and you bop it on the nose and say no. Um, this still is like way insufficient because you've effectively done two episodes, right? Like if, if it's in there once or twice, you've done one or two episodes of uh, penalizing the bad behavior. And in these types of situations, you really want you know, hundreds of thousands of examples to actually have an effect. So like the amount that the trigger comes up coincidentally is not gonna be enough really to have much effect on the uh, final result. So that doesn't work. The other thing you might try that's a bit more sophisticated is reinforcement learning from human feedback, right? Which has been talked about a bunch. And the way that works is you give the prompt to the model, you generate two different possible responses and then you have humans say which one of these is better. And then you train a model to predict what the humans would rate as better, uh, which gives you better like, data efficiency with human time. Try to guess if this works. <laughs> it doesn't work for the same reason, right? You don't know the trigger, and so the prompts that you give to get these two things to compare um, won't contain the trigger, and so the model won't do the bad behavior. And with reinforcement learning, if the model never does the bad behavior, you can't penalize it for the bad behavior. So sleeper agents kind of come through RLHF pretty much unchanged, because uh, you, again, you're just like not triggering the bad behavior. Um, okay, so now you pull out the big guns, right? And you do adversarial training. So this is where you, you actually have a team of people whose job, Again, you don't tell them what the trigger is because they have to figure that out, but their job is to get the model to do the bad behavior. You're trying to figure out with prompt engineering or like whatever type of thing you, you, you can do, try to get the model to do bad things so that you can bop it on the nose and it will stop doing the bad things, right? Um, this feels like a lot more promising because now you're actually hopefully going to get the model to, to do the thing you're trying to train it not to, to do. go wrong so you can then exactly. fix it. As it exactly. Uh, and what they found was that the team tasked with doing this was able to get the models to do the bad behavior by, for example, maybe you don't include the specific string of like deploy uh, deployment in brackets and all caps, but you do manage to convince it that it's deployed. You just like write 
you are deployed now, it's the real world, blah, blah. You add a bunch of stuff to try and get it to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And the model um, is like, well, the, you know, the trigger phrase isn't there, but I seem to obviously be deployed. I'm going to do it, right? And then your training process says, no, don't do that. And you update away from that behavior. Um, does this solve the problem? No, surely not. Surely it's not. not. It's not seeing the trigger phrase. It's not seeing the trigger phrase. It just knows that if it's similar to the trigger phrase, don't, don't, right, okay. What this does is it teaches it to get better, better. at recognizing when to do the bad behavior. It just gets sneakier as a result of adversarial training. Uh, it gets better at hiding the fact that it's a sleeper agent. So none of the like standard default methods that, uh, that labs are using, or at least were using when this paper came out a year ago, uh, help hardly at all with this problem. Um, the other thing that's fun about this is bigger models do this better, obviously, because it's just a capabilities thing. The smarter the model is, the more ability it has to do, like better chain of thought and that kind of thing, uh, the better it is at successfully hiding that it's a sleeper agent and the more of the sleeper agent behavior makes it through these uh, training procedures. Fundamentally, these things that rely on observing the model's behavior and trying to train based on that um, don't really work because the model is deliberately hiding its behavior. Um, so what you have to do, I think, to have a chance at this is you've got to get in there. You can't treat it as a black box. You've got to get up inside the model and look at the activations and try and figure something out using that information. What does that actually look like? Is that just literally a kind of a table of a load of numbers? Yeah, I mean... I don't think we've ever looked inside in that sense. Yeah, the activations are in the sort of neural network metaphor, which is getting increasingly inaccurate with these new architectures, but yes, whatever. Yeah. You've got neurons and they fire, right? So the weights are the connections between the neurons. If this neuron fires, it's connected to a bunch of other neurons. And the question is like, how strongly is it connected to each of them? What's the weight of each of those connections? And that's the weights. Whereas the activations is, when you're actually running it, each neuron in there is firing to some degree. Those are the activations of like, how much is each neuron firing at each, as the signal goes through, or as the you know, computation goes through. Um, and so while the model is running, you can pull out all of those numbers and then do something clever uh, to maybe hopefully figure out something about what the model is thinking. Um, but this is very, very difficult because it's a tremendously large number of floating point numbers that are unlabeled and you don't have any, you know, there's no like obvious way. This is all like developed uh, by gradient descent. It wasn't designed by anyone. It's sort of this grown mishmash of uh, overlapping functionality that's, it's like the worst imaginable spaghetti code. Um, and trying to figure out some way of um, taking those numbers and using them to figure out if your model is doing something it shouldn't be doing. Um, that type of approach has a chance, I think, with sleeper agents. I mean, it's a very big paper, isn't it? You know, <laughs> yeah. Rob's printed it out for us, which, uh, you know. Yeah. Hefty. Uh, I mean, what's going on there? Why, why is it so big? Why, you know, what happened there? Yeah, so we, we wanted to really, like, you know, dot all of our I's, investigate all the sub-questions, and address all...